Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is he who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to behold? A reed shaken by the wind? Why then did you go out? To see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, those who wear soft raiment are in king's houses. Why then did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face who shall prepare the way before thee. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And men of violence take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for you continue to speak to us. In the days of old, in the days of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, you spoke through the prophets. But now in these last days, you have spoken to us by your Son. And he has come to fulfill your word. Give us ears and hearts to hear, to perceive, and to believe. And in this season of Advent, Lord, let us enjoy the evangelical opportunity we have to, through our love, through our sharing of your word, of your mercy and your compassion, that we might prepare the way of the Lord, not only in our hearts, but in the hearts of those around us as well. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, who is our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Now, just as an aside, before we get into the meat of our text for today, it is Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent. Now, we've got the candles because it is the season of light. We got the candles on the advent wreath up here up front. We also have the candles. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we have and and, and the, the, the other candle back in there. We got the, the joy candle because it is Gaudete Sunday. It is time for us to rejoice in the coming of the Lord. And that's precisely why we call it Gaudete Sunday, because this third Sunday begins with a, a prayer. It's on scripture, of course. Where it goes something like this. It's going to sound familiar. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice, I say. Let your forbearance be known to all. For the Lord is near at hand. Have no anxiety about anything. But in all things, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Lord, you have blessed 
your land, you have turned away the captivity of Jacob. So that's the rejoice. It's a song we sing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We say it at chapel time. The kids know it backwards and forwards. I I can see Cynthia's shaking her head back there. She was singing. So what what song was it you were singing with uh, Lorelai the other day? I love you, Lord. And she starts singing the song and she looked at her mom and she said, you know that song too? It's amazing how all that works. Indeed. So it, it, we get that joy to share this season of wonderment with the children. Yesterday we had a, a wonderful event. I hope that some many of you came and that was a, a great blessing to be sure. It is a wonderful time, this season of Advent, the season of light, season of preparation. There are other things, too, that, you know, sometimes we we look around and, you know, the world can kind of be a bit of a drag at times, can it? Yeah. I wonder if we don't live in a world where it can just be way too easy to be offended at one another. I mean, you know, someone says something or does something we don't like or we don't agree with and. Well, you know, it's just off to the races at that point. Perhaps it's just part of the social media world we live in. We can't really blame it all on that. It's got a part to do with it. But, I mean, it's really kind of what's going on in our hearts. It is easy to get offended at one another. And I think particularly that's one of the challenges of social media because we don't have the closest. It's, you're standing with one another. If you have a relationship with a person, it's far less likely, not Completely unlikely, but far less likely that somebody would say something just offhand to offend us. And and then there's, of course, the idea of relationship that even if somebody said something, we might filter it through the lens of or or, or our ears of of knowing that person. So sometimes it can be uh, easier to understand in those terms. But it is, you know, we have to be careful. Uh, of the things that we say and think about. I and mean, that's why we talk about, in, you know, I tell the kids all the time, employ, employ your filter. Think about what you say before you say it. That was always something my dad tried to emphasize to me. I understand why. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, there's a hymn. And Pastor Phillips knows exactly which hymn I'm about to mention here. There's a verse in, in hymn 504 in our green hymnals. Uh, oh God, my faithful God. It goes, the third verse goes something like this. Keep me from saying words that later need recalling. Guard me lest idle speech may from my lips be falling. And now how many of us have ever said something we really wish were like a worm on the end of a pole? Yeah, Pastor Tobias is back there. You know, it's like, can I get that one back? Can I get that one back, please? It would be nice if it worked like that, but unfortunately it doesn't. Indeed. Of course, I don't know about you or or anyone else, but that certainly gets me a lot. Moving past our offenses, though, gives us the opportunity to forgive and be forgiven for words that later need recalling. It is easy to get offended at someone you don't have a relationship with because oftentimes there isn't a context for our minds to fill in the blanks. With that in mind, it's easy to understand being offended at one another. Yet in our gospel text for today, Jesus says something interesting about that. He said, blessed are they who are not offended by him. In this Advent season... We are preparing our hearts and minds for the coming of Christ. It's hard to imagine someone getting offended with Jesus, particularly when we think at this Christmas time, the little babe in the manger, right? But no, I guess it isn't quite so hard to imagine people being offended by Jesus after all. Especially when we remember that there are plenty of people that seem to be offended at Jesus. That are indeed scandalized by who he is and what he represents. Even, yes, what he does and how he does it. And that is true today as well as it was in the first century. 
In our gospel text, we hear Jesus say, blessed are they who takes no offense at me. And so we ask the question naturally, well, who is offended at him, at Jesus? We are in the third week of Advent, the season that is focused not only on the Messiah's first coming, but also a reminder as well to be prepared for his coming again as well. Jesus' first coming was indeed a monumental moment in history, the history of all creation, really the fulfillment of God's promise to send his specially chosen anointed one to redeem, to save. I mean, that is what Jesus' name means in the first place, Savior. This moment in history is so important That God promised not only to send the Messiah, but also to send one of his prophets, a special prophet, to prepare Israel for his coming. The second arrival, indeed, of the great prophet Elijah, as foretold by the penultimate prophet of the Old Testament, the one before the last one. That's what the concept penultimate means. And that's Malachi. The very last book of the Old Testament. And it is there we find this particular prophecy that points to the one who would precede the coming one. Now there is no question in our minds, especially after the fact. But there is no question as to the identity of this prophet. He is John the Baptist. He is the one who will make The mountains and the hills level, the crooked places straight, the rough places smooth to prepare the and the smooth places, uh, the rough places smooth and bear. Of course, he invites the people who gather together to bear fruits of repentance, as we heard in Pastor Phillips sermon last weekend. John knows precisely who he is and what he is to do. And he also knows who he is not as well. Of course, he says, I I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy even to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear the threshing floor. And gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, I'm not a farmer, but that doesn't sound good. I don't know what a winnowing fork is, but I don't think that's what you eat your salad with. Yes, indeed, John has a sense that Jesus, the Messiah, is coming to be the righteous one. And yes, as James reminds us in our second text for today, the judge is standing at the doors. But now, well, John's been arrested. And he's sitting in old Herod's jail cell, having called out the wicked Tetrarch for chasing after his brother's wife. That would tend to be a bit offensive, I would imagine. And when you do it to the king, you land in jail, apparently. All that sitting around is John thinking. He's heard about the deeds of the Christ, we are told today, and he wonders, are you the Messiah or shall we keep looking? When John's disciples catch up with Jesus, it's important for us to note the way in which Jesus answers the question. And it informs us as to the real central point of our gospel text for today. It's good that we have come about to the season of Matthew. We're in the in cycle A in terms of our texts. And so we come back to we we finished up with Luke last year, just a few weeks ago. We finished up with year C. We spend a lot of time preaching on Luke texts. And the year before that is the B series from Mark. Uh, This year, as we go forward, it's it's cycle A with Matthew kind of 
being at the forefront. And, and that's important for us in this Advent season, particularly in this text, because Matthew's central theme is to reveal Jesus as the fulfilling of God's promise, the fulfilling of the prophet's words. And that is precisely what our text reveals for us today. What does it mean for him to be the Messiah? Well, Jesus answers. He says, just what, what, what have I done? What, have, what has been done? Does it match with the words of God? Does it match with the prophets? And indeed, it most certainly does. Now, Jesus isn't worried about fulfilling expectations. There's all kinds of expectations in Israel in the first century about what it would mean for the Messiah, the coming one, to actually come. I mean, many believed, they expected the Messiah to come as a military, political, and economic genius. But no, that wasn't what God called Jesus to be. It wasn't what the scriptures pointed to. He was indeed fulfilling the wish of the Father. There's a point at which Jesus is asked, are you hungry? You haven't been eating, Jesus. How come you're not eating? And Jesus' response is, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And if we want to know that will, that's what we have the prophets for today. That's what we read in our first lesson from Isaiah. Jesus is keen for John and all others, really, even including ourselves, to recognize that that, that is precisely what he's doing. He is fulfilling God's word. And so it is just as we read in Isaiah. The eyes of the blind are opened. The ears of the deaf are unstopped. The lame leap. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. Now, if you're one of the poor, the downtrodden, the needy, those who find themselves weak and broken, that is fantastic news. If you don't happen to be in that crowd, your level of expectation is somewhat askew. But indeed, that is who God is coming for. Not the powerful, not the elite, but the weak and those of us who see our brokenness. We know what Jesus has been doing in those seven chapters between what we are or eight chapters, what we read last week and, and and pastor preached on in our texts from then to now. Jesus has been doing these kinds of things with great mercy and compassion. So it does seem to be odd that there are some who would be offended, not only with John the Baptist, but also with Jesus. Who would be so offended? Well, we can start with the usual suspects, of course. I mean, that was the crowd that came up when John the Baptist saw them coming while they were all gathered at the banks of the Jordan as he's inviting people to, be, to a baptism of repentance. He looks off in the distance and he sees the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pastor humor is, well, a little off, just can I, I share with you? Pastor Tobias sent me a meme this week. It's just the jokes that we have between each other. So there's a guy in the meme standing there with, with a big, long, furry, matted beard and, and a wild look in his face. And it says, Happy Advent, you brood of vipers. I know it's not all that funny, but we pastors laugh at it. It's kind of who we are. We're just a little off to begin with. It's how it works. But, but, but John saw them coming, those brood of vipers. Why? Why are you coming? Is it because you think you need to repent too? <sighs> really? Repent? We are. No. But then again, I think that's kind of the point of Jesus today. Is Would they have been so offended if they had acknowledged their own Brokenness. Would they have been so offended if they had seen their own human weakness, had, had realized the need they have, like all of us, for a Savior and desiring the hope and the joy and the peace and, yes, indeed, the love that Christ would bring if they had 
known those things, if they had been familiar with them, if they had been, had a relationship with Jesus, would they have had this same response? But it is true. They were offended by him and by so many things that he said and did. Now, our text, I think, in some ways is somewhat limiting us. I'd like to expand it just a little bit. There's a few verses that are 16, 17, 18, 19 that I think really inform us in terms of understanding what Jesus meant by this idea. Blessed are you, they who are not offended by me. So so verse 16 starts like this. But to what shall I compare this generation? Jesus said that before. And then he tells kind of a a mini parable. It's like a chill. It's like children sitting in the marketplace calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, look, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him, a glutton. And a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yes, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Thanks be to God. Truly, because we have faith, we are not offended by Christ. And our faith, friends, is no blind faith, but one led and guided by the word of God. Which is why it is so important as we prepare for his coming to daily be in the word, praying with it, being strengthened by it, acknowledging Jesus as the Christ, the one who came, who is with us now and who promises still to come and redeem us. We are truly blessed to know him. And prepare a place for him as we wait expectantly. James helps us with this. And of course, what does he point us to? Of all things, patience. I mean, really patience. I mean, apparently James does not drive on Jacksonville roads. Of course, maybe that maybe that he has driven on Jacksonville roads. That's why he's promoting patience. Who knows? He says, be patient, strengthen your hearts like the prophets of old, walking in steadfastness and patience, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of all the offense going on around us. Be not offended and seek Christ in the midst of this challenging generation, trusting in God's compassion and mercy, which so clearly distinguishes Jesus as God's anointed. The way we do this, of course, is certainly not relying on our innate abilities, but instead in this season of gift giving, asking for one more. Well, I guess not really one more gift, but nine of them, actually, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, there is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and everybody's favorite, self-control. That we, we, saw, we put that way at Thanksgiving. With that burning fire of the Holy Spirit, of course, that gift of faith, which enables us not to be offended, but rather blessed by the knowledge and belief that Jesus is the coming one. That as Isaiah foretold, he is Emmanuel, God with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us take a minute, a moment to reflect on what that means for Jesus to be our blessed Messiah.